Hi everyone, hope you're doing well. I originally wanted to make this video about pale blood, a far more speculative and elusive topic than cold blood, but I believe now that understanding cold blood is a good primer for understanding bloodborne and the old blood as a whole. Cold blood is a topic that has interested me for quite a while in terms of what it actually is and how it acts differently to blood as we understand it in the real world. I am no doctor or student of medicine by any degree, so I invite you to critique anything I frame incorrectly as I always love reading your thoughts and feedback. To know what cold blood is, our first point of understanding comes from looking at what happens once it leaves a human body. In fact, the majority of our information is based around how cold blood acts outside of a host. For instance, the reason why blood dries in the real world is because it undergoes a process known as oxidation. Without going into the minutiae of what oxidation entails, it essentially involves a loss of electrons in the blood itself, which essentially quote-unquote kills the blood cells that are exposed to air. Of course, there is another factor to consider in this regard, which is called coagulation, or clotting. Clotting is what happens when you, for example, receive a cut or a scratch that draws blood. After a relatively short amount of time, the body reacts to this cut in a different way, and does not oxidate all the blood in and around the cut, thankfully, and instead creates what is commonly referred to as a scab, which is caused by a series of enzymatic processes to stop the flow of blood and to repair the damaged area. What is striking about cold blood is that it reacts almost entirely different to the concepts I have hopefully explained in an understandable way. Cold blood does not coagulate, but rather for the most part, it undergoes crystallization. Additionally, it does not quote unquote die from oxidation, but instead remains a bed of life, all of which we'll discuss shortly. In short, cold blood is not completely subservient to humans, but rather it acts as a host of sorts. Anyone who has played Bloodborne understands that transfusions of old blood by the healing church resulted in the patients developing beastly qualities and eventually turning into monsters themselves. One thing to note early on is while cold blood is a physical entity present in Yharnam, the blood echoes within them seem only to be available for utilization by hunters that are sustained or trapped, depending on your perspective, by the hunter's dream. This is told to us in the description of Cold Blood Dew, which reads, Hunters sustained by the dream gain strength from blood echoes. They imbibe the blood with thoughts of reverence, indeed gratitude, for their victims. Blood echoes are described in the game as the bloody memories of those cursed by the plague of the beast. This is where we begin our understanding. Blood echoes are the memories of experiences of those who became beasts, and these memories are trapped within cold blood. One thing that is instantly noticeable about cold blood from the images of the items is that the blood is not dry. Even cold blood that we find in all the nooks and crannies of Bloodborne has been sitting around for quite a while. Some of you may be saying, but blood can remain wet, just look at the blood that is used for transfusions in the real world. That's true, however, blood banks are institutions that invest heavily into complex systems that refrigerate and cool blood to a level that prevents oxidation and extends preservation. We see no such system in Bloodborne, which leads me to believe that cold blood simply never oxidates. The closest it gets, as I mentioned before, is crystallization. The byproducts of this crystallization are blood gems. In chemistry, crystallization can only occur when a solution is supersaturated, or when there are too many solids dissolved or undissolved in a solvent. If the blood itself acts as a solvent, then blood echoes are the solute. An overabundance of these blood echoes could theoretically then lead to crystallization, forming blood gems, essentially gemstones that are created from solidified blood echoes. From this, we can start to see that cold blood is only one piece of the puzzle and acts as a chemically rich environment in which blood echoes can both be absorbed and changed into different forms. Something to be aware of is that blood echoes held within the blood shape the power and strength of the overall cold blood. As I stated before, echoes draw their power from the experiences of those affected by the beastly curse, but we can also be informed by other elements. Firstly, we must discuss one's mindset, and then later on, madness and cosmic understanding. The description of thick cold blood reads, A strong will produces thick blood. Doubtless, the product of obsession, a potent source of human strength. The most important element of this is to mention of the strong will, or in other words, determination. 
Presumably, one's blood would start acting and changing in such a way only after a transfusion of old blood had been made, and the speed of intensity of one's transformation into a beast would be dependent on their determination and will. This can be extended to two other very important concepts, madness and cosmic understanding. It is said in the description of the madman's hood that those who go mad are merely thoughtful souls who fail to reach any conclusions. In other words, those who mused on the eldritch truth but never encountered or understood it went mad. Conveniently, this concept clicks perfectly with the description of the frenzied cold blood which reads, This manifestation of madness comes from a mind teetering on the very brink, but has a sane mind ever produced anything of true significance? We see here an excellent parallel between a growing amount of blood echoes within cold blood and the extent of one's madness. By the end of this, we will begin to understand why exactly healing church leaders, especially vicars, went through some of the most intense transformations into beasts. The description of the kin cold blood reads, Cold blood of inhuman kin of the cosmos, brethren of the great ones, used to gain unspeakable blood echoes. Dare not to delve into the world beyond humanity, the eldritch truth touched upon long ago at Bergenworth. The progression of cold blood as a commodity in Bloodborne mirrors almost exactly the progression of several members of the healing church, including Lawrence. While Lawrence never became a great one himself, he did understand the eldritch truth. It begins with a strong will, then madness, then clarity. That is a direct connection to advanced stages of beasthood and madness. In a sense, one understands more and more about the Great Ones and the Eldritch Truth, but at the same time, those who have undergone transfusion have the cold blood within them to alter, shift, and change, crystallizing but also compounding memory and experience within a malleable substance. Perhaps this is why beings like Vicar Amelia and Ludwig transformed so violently, not because of their proximity to the blood, but how the cold blood within them started to grow in power, to a point where their mind would lose control of the body, and the blood itself would become a host, controlling one's actions, essentially turning one into a mindless beast. One visual element of cold blood that I'd like to touch on is that all cold blood variations up to, including, and after frenzied seem to be bubbling. Bubbles in one's blood in real life can have dire consequences. If untreated, bubbles in the blood can lead to embolism or emboli forming in the bloodstreams, which can lead to a myriad of problems, among them being stroke. One symptom of a stroke is emotional lability, which essentially can result in emotional outbursts like laughing occurring with limited provocation. This can be seen quite frequently throughout Bloodborne, and it could be possible that one's cold blood evolving contributes to these symptoms. Another topic that should be mentioned is blood dregs. The description of a blood dreg reads, The vile bloods of Canehurst, blood-lusting hunters, see these frightful things in cold blood. They often appear in the blood of echo fiends, that is to say, the blood of hunters. Queen Annalise partakes in these blood dregs offerings so that she may one day bear the child of blood, the next vile blood heir. This helps us understand that along with cold blood evolving within the bodies of scholars and Yarnamites, the life and actions of hunters cause specific mutations within cold blood, which is in the case of the blood dregs. The dregs are highly prized by vile blood warriors, who take the dregs back to Annalise. As we know, however, no matter how many dregs you give to Annalise, she never does give birth to a child of blood, or a celestial child as they are also known as. This shows to us that the vile bloods, some of the oldest beings in the Yarnum surrounding area, may not understand completely the intentions of the Great Ones. My Canehurst videos go into more detail regarding the Child of Blood if you're interested, but I just thought it'd be worth mentioning how cold blood can change and mutate within the bodies of those who undertake different professions. Blood gems are a little harder to define in terms of what they actually are. We know from blood gems that blood echoes and cold blood can physically manifest into other shapes and gems during crystallization, but there is also part of the blood that is not crystallized, which is where bloodstones come in. The description of the bloodstone shard reads, a solid shard that forms in cold blood. After death, a substance in the blood hardens, and that which does not crystallize is called a bloodstone. At the workshop, these bloodstones are embedded in weapons to fortify them. 
As I stated, the description specifically states that stones form out of the elements that do not crystallize. Those are the blood gems. But is perhaps oxidized to a certain extent, despite oxidation being mostly absent from the concept of cold blood. What is interesting is that these stones supposedly form after death, not simply after the blood has been exposed to oxygen. From this, we can hypothesize that cold blood in its most raw form can be utilized effectively after it has left the body, but stones can only be found or harvested only after the body itself has died. I believe this might strengthen the theory that the old blood acts as a parasitic host upon a person, but that might be a topic for another video. The strength and power of certain bloodstones may be dependent on the host's size and strength of their blood, only because of the line that comes from the bloodstone chunk, which reads, A chunk will never appear in the blood of an ordinary human. Seek deadlier foes if a bloodstone chunk is needed. I think a good allegory for understanding cold blood to an extent is showcased in John Carpenter's 1982 film, The Thing. As an aside, it's one of my favourite films, and if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it if you're a fan of sci-fi horror. I'll give a bit of context here so those who haven't seen it can understand what I'm getting at without spoiling anything. If you want to avoid this allegory entirely for fear of even surface level story details, I'll add a timestamp to the description. The film is set in Antarctica, at a research base and revolves around a small group of men who operate the facility. Initially, without their knowledge, a foreign organism begins to infect the group and is able to replicate the host perfectly until it decides to become hostile. A test is soon devised to understand who is infecting who by putting a superheated piece of metal into a blood sample from each member of the team, with the following hypothesis put forward by the ever-incredible Kurt Russell. You tie up Palmer over here. We're going to draw a little bit of everybody's blood. Because we're going to find out who's the thing. Watching Norris in there gave me the idea that maybe every part of him was a whole. Every little piece was an individual animal with a built-in desire to protect its own life. You see, when a man bleeds, it's just tissue. No blood from one of you things won't obey when it's attacked. It'll try and survive. Crawl away from a hot needle, say. In a way, this same concept can be applied to Bloodborne. Not in the sense that blood will try to escape danger, but that the blood itself is a collection of living and conscious organisms. It's important to understand that not only is the blood alive to an extent, but that it is a bed of life, and produces life itself. This is seen in cold blood flowers, and in my opinion, tomb mold and ritual blood. Before discussing these three elements, think about what a conscious organism could do to a person if it were being transfused within a body. Could it influence thoughts as well? When discussing cold blood flowers, it's important to differentiate between them and lumen flowers, and lumen wood for that matter. My research into lumen flora is not extensive, but I'd like to say right now that the flowers located at the top of the research hall are most likely not cold blood flowers. We find cold blood flowers throughout their growth cycle, beginning with flower buds, then flower bulbs, and finally blooming flowers. The description of cold blood flower buds reads, Pale vegetation that commonly grows on cold blood in a place long ago abandoned. From this we understand that these flowers grow out of cold blood, presumably cold blood, that has been outside a human host for a period of time. Obviously in the real world, flowers don't grow out of blood, which further solidifies that cold blood is more than just a vessel for blood echoes, but has characteristics very distinct from our own understanding of blood. Blood requires enzymes, proteins, and many other human functions to operate as it is supposed to, but here we see, plain as day, that cold blood can act independently of a human host, creating life from essentially nothing. 
The description mentions that this process occurs more commonly in a place long ago abandoned. Now, this is a description that could be applied to many different locations like Old Yarnum, Canehurst, or the Chalice Dungeons. There are a few places in my travels that I have noticed called blood flowers, most notably in the E's Chalice Dungeons, the Nightmare Frontier, and in the passage leading into the giant sanctuary located beneath Yosefka's clinic. Many cold blood flower bulbs can be found in these locations, and the item itself has a description that reads, Pale vegetation that commonly grows on cold blood in a place long abandoned, said to mature slowly in close proximity to death and eventually bloom. From this we can understand that large amounts of cold blood flowers spring forth in places where much blood has been shed, perhaps as a living reminder of what had transpired there. Loran clerics seem to drop cold blood flowers upon death, which may imply that these flowers had a presence in Loran before its fall, perhaps as an item of great significance. It may also tell us that cold blood as a concept and organism existed as far back as the time of Loran itself. The cold blood flowers that bloom have a description that reads, Pale vegetation that grows on cold blood in a place long abandoned that has bloomed into a bright red Stygian flower. While this repeats some of what we already know, something that stood out to me was how the flowers are described as Stygian, which means for something to be in reference to the river Styx from Greek mythology. Styx was both a river and a deity, and acted as a boundary between Earth and the underworld. While Stygian can also be in reference to the darkness of an object's colour, I believe that the use of the word is quite deliberate. There are such boundaries within Bloodborne, bridges that exist between the waking world and the dreamlands, the most prominent being the lecture hall, which might as well be floating endlessly through some dark abyss, as its purpose is to bridge one's travels through space and time. I'd like to explore this allegory of the sticks in future videos, but let me know what you think in the meantime. A quick note on tomb mold. I believe that this mold is similar in nature to cold blood flowers. The description reads, mold that grows from rotten flesh and blood inside the old labyrinth, matures to bear giant spores. Since the mold grows within flesh and blood, I would place it within the same category as the flowers, but they are not the same thing. The cold blood flowers are a prized item, hidden away and kept protected, while two molds can be found on the corpses of rats. What I would propose as a theory is that two mold grows in the cold blood of the watchers, those who would watch over the chalice dungeons. I'll be honest, however, I'm not 100% sure about where I stand on two mold, so be sure to let me know what you think. There's two final topics I'd like to touch on, beast blood pellets and ritual blood. As I stated earlier, we have established that cold blood does not coagulate, but rather goes through a mixed process of crystallization and hardening, with some left at the end that does not undergo either. The only reason why I'm touching on beast blood pellets is just to alleviate anyone's concerns regarding the lack of coagulation. The description reads, Large medicinal pellets, supposedly formed of coagulated beast blood, Banned by the healing church due to their unclear origin, grants a spurt of beasthood. This information would, at first glance, seem to fly in the face of what we have been discussing, saying that beast blood coagulates. I would doubt the legitimacy of this, just as the description itself does because of the word the use of the word supposedly. This is not a product of the healing church, it seems, but rather a more homebrew drug that was either created in Yarnum by chemists or came from outside the city. The point is that no one seems to know where it comes from, and may in fact be a placebo. I know you may disagree with this since your damage output changes after ingesting one of these pellets, but there could be other reasons for that. Let's continue. Ritual blood is something that has interested me for a while as well, and again contradicts information that we have just talked about. The description of the ritual blood reads, One of the basic ingredients used to satiate a holy chalice is this incoagulable blood. When all is melted in blood, all is reborn. Let's say hypothetically for a moment that ritual blood may be the blood left over after crystallization and hardening is complete, since it specifically says that the blood is incoagulable. If we look at the progression of rarity of the ritual blood, we can see that the blood moves, quakes, with skulls of blood emerging from the murky liquid. This harks back to what I was talking about with cold blood being a bed of life. Ritual blood is the basis for all chalice dungeon rituals, and so must have been integral to sending a communication to the watchers to let down the defences of said dungeons. 
Similar to how Native Americans utilized many different parts of a slain buffalo, it would seem that the healing church would use every part of the blood, whether it was to strengthen weapons, provide benefit to themselves, or stage rituals. For all the problems of the healing church, and by God there are many, they did understand to a degree what the blood was capable of producing, and from this video I hope you understand now as well. That'll wrap us up for this episode, I think, so thank you for watching. This video was quite a bit more speculative than I'm used to, but I hope you enjoyed it all the same. There was quite a bit of gap of time between the Maria video and this one, so it was pretty late, and that's something that I'm not super happy about, just because I like to have consistency. Unfortunately, life does get very busy sometimes, but I'll always try my best to get these out uh, on time. I'm not 100% sure about what the next topic will be, but I do uh, have a, quite a lot of ideas swirling around my head at the moment. Let me know in the comments what you think should come next. As always, I can always be reached on the Facebook page or Twitter or in the YouTube comments. Until next time.